Fox's brand new Joe Pickett novel, Dark Sky, which I hold in my hand and CJ joins us. I don't know where you are, CJ. Where are you? I'm on our uh, <coughs> on our little ranch in Wyoming. So you haven't started the book out. tour? Uh, there is no book tour. It's all virtual. Oh, no. Oh, my no gosh. Book. How is that? Well, it's very, I was just, I was telling my wife yesterday for the first time in 21 years on publication date, I'm at home. Uh, well, so, you know, that's, it's different. It's, it, how many different interviews are you going to do today? Uh, I think about 21. Okay. Well, this is a long form. The first part of Dark Sky interview with Chuck Box is on the air. And then I'm taking him long. So you have to go to the interview with Hugh Hewitt to hear the rest about Dark Sky. Uh, CJ, let me begin with a high, high compliment. 21 Joe Pickett novels. This may be the fastest start and the most grip. It's just a gripper. Uh, have you heard that from other people? I have heard that from a few people, yeah. But um, it means a lot coming from you because I know you've read all the books. And I, I have. I, I have read every. I appreciate that. I, I, I'm on page 204 per my usual practice. I read it the day before and I stop, so I don't know how it ends, so I cannot tell anyone, but as soon as this show is over, I'm going to go finish the last hundred so pages. I only have one fact check on you, all right? Yeah. On page 109, it has personally never taken me 18 days to take an elk, Chuck, so I, and yet you assert the average time to take an elk is 18 days. Are you sure about that? Because it's never taken me 18 days. Well, I know well, that's because you're an exceptional shot. And well, I'm just a, saying it, it never happened. But is it uh, 18 days? It is. What well, it's that act, that fact actually comes from the department that does surveys of elders and um, put how many got an elk and how long it took. Um, the reason that that's so skewed is that some people just don't get one. Far you you'll know what it is. The new acting prosecutor in Saturday. You know, ever since C.J. Box started <laughs> including a character named Judge Hewitt. In, People, the callers just call me, did you know that, Hewitt, how are you? Even though my judge Hewitt now because of you, CJ. Yeah, and, and because the, the description to you is you know, snark and tea. That's yeah. it. Well, Judge Hewitt, I just love the, the Scottish falconry tomes. Do you want to explain to people Scottish falconry tomes? Or Romanowski plays a big role. Um, kind of Nate Romanowski has now, he's an outlaw falconer. I talked to you before. Here's where the big market expansion occurs with Dark Sky. It's about a Silicon Valley billionaire who lands in saddle string and goes on a hunt. And he looks an awful lot like, but is not, Mark Zuckerberg. Would you say that the appearance is similar? I would say the appearance is similar, and I would say that um, I kind of got the idea for uh, this character when I read a story um, that for one year Mark Zuckerberg wanted to provide, um, basically take care of himself in regard to food and that a, another tech billionaire had visited him at his house, and Mark Zuckerberg went out in his backyard and killed a goat um, so that they could eat. Uh, because for that year, he was he was finding out about how to procure, procure your own protein. And that got me going on the character. It is, it is a remarkable uh, collision of Wyoming with Silicon Valley. That's why I like this book so much. I've met Mark a couple of times. I know a bunch of Silicon Valley people like Peter Thiel and other ones like uh, 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 Keith Crock uh, and other people like that. And the idea of them on an elk hunt in Wyoming is, is discombobulating. However, your commentary on social media throughout the book is going to very much attract uh, many people across America. When you have Mary Beth Pickett say, the world doesn't need to know everything he experiences. There's value in solitude. Is that a message intended for all millennials? It certainly is. Um, yeah, I feel I, I do feel kind of prescient with this book because it was actually completed last May, and um, the whole thing about you know social media cancel culture, um, censorship, how it affects people on the ground. Um, all those things have, you know, are, are in, obviously. I listen to you every day. Are in the news all over the place right now. Did you did you see that today, the day we're talking, Google has announced it's no longer going to collect information on all searches. So, you know, if, if anyone sees my, you know, if Google collects my searches, they see a lot of thrillers. So, no, I always get these thriller ads for people I've never read before, but they do collect, organize, and market on that basis. And your meditation via the conversation between Joe and Steve, too, is his name. 
is really, uh, you've been thinking about this for a long time, obviously, Chuck. I have, and, um, you know, I have three daughters. They have grown up with social media. They've never been alive when it wasn't part of their lives. And I've, I've you know, we've had some discussions with them um, over the last year or so about how they're, you know, they, they're thinking of withdrawing because, um, you know, they get judged by people they've never met. They post something innocuous and somebody else weighs in. It makes them um, paranoid almost. And um, you, as you know, um, things can happen. That's what happens in the book. Um, the, there's a, an incident with a young girl um, who's shamed on social media and she commits suicide. And um, it's not unfair, but uh, nobody takes responsibility. Well, Dark Sky is prescient in a lot of things. It's also very, uh, very true. I laugh out loud when one of the Pickett daughters says to the mother, Joe, Joe Pickett's wife, dad texts in full sentences. And they laugh at him because of that. Because that's what my kids do. They laugh at me because I text in full sentences and I won't use emojis. I won't, you know, I will not go into that world. But there are lots of people out there, including former national security officials who use emojis all the time because the, the chai comms can't figure it out. Oh, that's interesting. No, I, I have been, I, I, I've been on the other end of that one too. You know, I, I, know I, I gathered that might be the case. Now, I don't want to give too much away, but Steve too, and you'll learn this in the first chapter. Uh, this is the last bit of the long interview for the, the Dark Sky people. Everyone who's read the other 20 books I want to talk to Chuck about is crap. Uh, Dark Sky is a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday book. Some of the Joe Pickett books are over many weeks. Whenever you start out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know you're in for a wild ride, right? Hopefully, yes. Yeah, everything happens very fast. That is what I, I think is why, how many of your books of the 21 Joe Pickett books have been Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday books? Only a couple. Uh, most of them you know, take place over you know, uh, a week or two, um, sometimes a month or two. This one happens very quickly. Now, I think Dark Sky will be a number one bestseller again. How many Joe Pickett books have made it to the top of the New York Times list, uh, Chuck Fox? Three have. Three have been number one. And the last, uh, in the last, of the last 10, if they weren't number one, they were number two. All right. So I'm going to predict number one for this because you've added a whole new audience in and the millennials will be interested. And the fun part about it's like taking little boys camping when you take Silicon Valley billionaires into the Montana, into the Wyoming uh, mountains, that's going to, people are going to love this. They're just going to love sort of this, but do you think you're ever going to get invited to Mark's house for dinner? <laughs> I, I would go if, as long as he would go out in the backyard and kill a goat. I, yeah. I don't want that experience, but otherwise I doubt it. I, you know, I think you might be wrong about that. I think he's going to enjoy this book based on what I know about him. Now, I also want to say, I am surprised constantly by your research the California Hawking Club exists, and it has a written test that qualifies people for the first step in their falconry license. True or false? True, true. Um, most states who have falconry licenses adopt the California Hawking Club test. And uh, the members of the California Hawking Club like the, my depiction of falconry well enough that they've made me an honorary member. I didn't have to pass a test. And as I read closely in the book, I stop and look up stuff. I looked up yesterday, peregrinefund.org. There is a wall of remembrance at peregrinefund.org for famous falconers and for falconers who fall to their death. That is an incident described or alluded to in, in Dark Sky. How often does that happen, Chuck? Well, fall to their death, not often, but uh, those falconers who actually obtain their birds themselves uh, wild birds have to climb, um, you know, on the on the face of cliffs where the the nests are, and either, you know, grab the little fledglings or take the eggs. And so it's it's a little bit um, unsafe and a little scary for them to do it. But they're most most falconers are mountaineers as well. You see, I did not I missed that, or I've forgotten it from the previous twenty books. And falconing has been in the books for a long time. I also had forgotten or missed that it began in Scotland. I associate it with the Middle East. Uh, is it really a Scottish? Did they invent it? I don't, you know, I don't know the answer if they invented it, but they certainly 
perfected the, um, the all the tropes around falconry, um, just like they did with fly fishing and golf. So give them some credit. Um, but yeah, the, most of the books, for example, um, about falconry are started in Scotland. All right. Now I want to go broader, uh, CJ Box, to the 21 Joe Pickett novels and your dozen other books. There's one set of Joe Pickett short stories, which I don't include in the 21. Let's give the person who's tuning in for the first time a little bit of an overview. When did you, and, and this is in our previous interviews, but this will be in the podcast. So let's, let's make it possible. When and where did you start with Joe Pickett? Well, Joe Pickett um, uh, came on the scene in 2001. Um, it took, you know, for the f previous five years, I'd been working on a book. Um, in my mind, it was more about the, the effects of the Endangered Species Act on the ground and how, you know, well-meaning legislation goes awry. And as I was researching that, um, I was also working at a newspaper and doing ride-alongs with a local game warden and realized that the best protagonist to tell this story would be a game warden. He'd be involved in all of these uh, resource issues, endangered species issues. He'd be out in the field. Um, so that book was called Open Season. It came out, and um, the book was very successful, and the publisher wanted two more with Joe Pickett, and that's how the series was born. I was never, never thought, oh, man, people really want to read a Wyoming game warden series. Um, but that's how it, that's how it began. And luckily, no, I, am, I am a purist and I tell all listeners, you can read dark sky. If you want to, you're denying yourself, not necessarily a pleasure because you can go back and read other ones. You don't have to read any of them. Actually, they all stand alone. But if you want the full effect, you start at the beginning and you move through and you get old with Joe, cause it's a book a year for 20 years. It's a remarkable yeah. achievement, Chuck. Well, thank you. Yeah, not all of them, you know, they, they take place in real time, but not all of them are a year apart. Some literally start, uh, you know, the, a couple of weeks after the last book um, or four months or whatever. But yeah, Joe Pickett is 32 in the very first book with, you know, young children and a, and a young wife. And now in this book, um, in Dark Sky, when he climbs off his horse, it really hurts. <laughs> he's 51 years old, and uh, he's feeling. And he's been shot. Yeah. Not in this book, but he's been shot before, and it's cold. And it all. I guess the winter. It, it's sort of like a bone breakage. If you get shot, the winter or the cold weather makes it a little bit tougher to move around. Right. And uh, yeah, his, his Steve too noticed. Why are you limping? And Joe said, "I got shot." Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I, I want to lay out for the audience, I was talking with CJ offline yesterday preparing for this, and I have my new construct. There are three thriller writers who come on whenever they write a book. Daniel Silva, Brad Thor, and CJ Box. I originally did not want to read Chuck's books because I didn't think they were thrillers. They are most definitely thrillers, and I've now come to the conclusion of all the thrillers, I've read hundreds of thrillers. I mean, that's what I do. Back to Le Carre and forward to C.J. Bach. Joe Pickett is the most American character of them all. And, you know, Daniel Silva, obviously, Gabriel Alon is an Israeli. And Brad Thor does most of his work outside of the United States. But everything that happens to C.J. Box happens in Wyoming or Montana. It's, he's a thoroughly American character. And I compared him to High Noon and Gary Cooper. He's just, he's an archetypal American. And I love that comparison. Um, I think you're the only one who's ever made that that analogy, and I love it. You know, I, and I'm a thriller. I'm, I'm a thriller fan too. Um, yeah, the difference is in in my case, in this case, you know, the outside world comes to Joe. He doesn't go to the outside world, um, and and he's because he's a state employee. He's going to be in Wyoming, you know, constantly. He's only taken a few trips. So, yeah, it, all these, even though we talk about, you know, technology and social media and all that, it comes to him as opposed to him going out. Would you also agree, I didn't discuss this with you, and I don't mean to drive off any readers, but if there are red state characters and blue state characters, Joe Pickett is most definitely a red state character, though he is apolitical. I agree completely. And I think, but I also think it's very accurate um, to, you know, the state I live in. Um, you know, I was just reading yesterday that Wyoming has um, the Wyoming Senate has two Democratic senators in it. That's I was it. looking up yesterday uh, home ownership uh, and guns, the correlation. The most homes with a gun in it 
is in Montana. In second place is Wyoming. Oh, Guns are no tools, doubt. as you say. Yeah, they are tools. I mean, I, I remember having a debate with a fellow writer um, on a fishing trip, and he was saying, how many guns do you own? And I actually counted them all up, and I was almost embarrassed to tell him um, a lot. Yeah. One of the things I also came up with is my new game, Next Joe Pickett book. And by the way, he's 51 now, I'm 65. So I'm counting on a Joe Pickett novel a year till I'm 80 at least, Chuck. <laughs> I think it's going to happen. Okay, I just want to say, this is, you got to get to work again because I want one. I want my Joe Pickett fix and I want your uh, your off brand. Uh, I have a bone to pick with you in a moment because you got me to watch that ABC about Ronald. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. But let's stay on Joe Pickett for a second. 21 books, a very American character, beautiful scenery. Why isn't there a Joe Pickett series? Well, um, I cannot step on the official announcement, but um, there will be. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's all it's gearing up right now. Um, finally. Uh, it's by next fall, it'll be on the air. Finally. Where are they going to film this possible series? Calgary. <laughs> well, that's not too far away, is it? No, and the, the landscape is very simple. Um, Part of it is, just like with Big Sky, uh, the Canadian TV people have made it very easy for American productions to go there and get, be in COVID bubbles, um, as well as the film incentives. So I, I've yeah. got a couple of buddies who are showrunners up there, Dean Batali and, and Brian Bird, and they have been making television and movies in Canada for as long as you've been writing Joe Pickett novels, and they just say the economics, it works in Canada. Right, right, it does. And... Um, you know, I, I, of course, wish it was filmed in Wyoming, and I think they're going to film some. They're going to they're, they're going to do some background stuff so that they should you know have the scenery just like they do in Big Sky. But production will be in Calgary. You know, they got a Carnegie Library in Warren, Ohio. If they need a shot of a Carnegie Library, you can do a local shot in Warren, Ohio. Well, that, sure, okay. <laughs> okay, they got a Carnegie Library in Saddle String, America. That's why I want you to know that. So. Um, I also have a new idea, which I think is, uh, Dwayne and I discussed it earlier. I'm so glad you got rid of the corrupt prosecutor, by the way. Uh, if I could only get rid of my corrupt producer just as easily, that would be a good thing. But um, Don't let him walk outside at night. You know, I just, I'm happens. telling you, he, he, he's sad that he's gone. But <laughs> Joe Pickett bingo, and this is the way it works, America. <laughs> if you're familiar with Joe Pickett, and I realized this again when I picked up Big Dark Sky because it's so good is that you're looking for the new, but you want to have the pleasure of seeing the old. It's, it's like uh, going home, it's like picking up a Joe Pickett novel, and you want a new story, you want a new conversation, you want a new experience, but you also want the Burgo partner or the partner burger or whatever it's called, and, and you want the, the gun talk. And you, I mean, we could do, I'm gonna put the Burgo partner at my center square, so, what do you think? Would it work? I and mean, no characters allowed. That's too easy. Oh, I, I think it's I, I think it's a wonderful idea, and um, you know I kind of keep that that bingo thing in mind as I write because um, there are certain things you know they're realistic. Um, it's, it's one guy. He's going through life. He's got certain touchstones, but there are certainly um, things that have carried through from the very first book in regard to locations and situations and. Um, tropes that uh, I always try to include because I know readers enjoy it and um, I, I think it makes it more realistic. Yeah, they're not tropes, but they're the way people live. Uh, if you've got a mother-in-law, she doesn't have to be Missy, but she's going to show up <laughs> a lot in your life, right? Yeah, usually at the very worst time possible. Uh, yeah. it, that's it. Some of us are got lucky with that. Now I want to talk about uh, your uh, ability to mix the new with the old. This goes to writing, and I, and I thought the demand of a long series like this is to keep it fresh. And somehow you've kept Joe Pickett fresh for 21 years. And if, you had been, if you'd started up that mountain 21 years ago and you'd have to go for 21 years, I don't know if you would have climbed it. But how do you, when you sit down for the first book or, or the first page of the new book, how do, you, how do you get your mind around a fresh approach? Well, you know what? I think it's more about 
the uh, um, the issue or the topic or the you know the controversy more so than it is the plot or the um, you know the murder investigation or whatever. So you know, in the case of Dark Sky, it's about social media and um, it's also about falconry smuggling. Two topics that I find really really fascinating. So I. I do the work on those, do the research first, and then figure out how to build a plot around it. If every if every book was simply how do we solve this mystery, I don't know if I could. I, I know I couldn't keep that up. Um, you know, there's only so many ways to tell that story. But because these are about things, real life topics um, that I find really fascinating, it keeps my interest up and hopefully you know readers as well. In, in uh, Dark Sky, you managed to tie the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species together with Antifa. So that got my interest, too, by the way, because I'm an old, retired ESA lawyer, and I thought that was a wonderful tie-in. And, and when did that develop in, in the writing of the book? Well, you know, I wanted a character. Um, I, I, I want an enemy for Nate Romanowski who is a younger, almost younger version of himself, yep. younger, more ruthless. And his ideology is tied to Antifa as opposed to um, Nate's, which is more kind of like libertarian. Uh, so th that it just sort of uh, developed organically, and it made me start thinking about the book after Dark Sky um, and what that's going to be about. Now, have you found that the falconers out there uh, have – found you to be authentic. You know, there are some people, Steve Pressfield was on with me uh, in, the, in the podcast series, and I asked him about the, uh, the early Christian world, and there's just not that much to know about it. So no one can really, well, there's a lot to know about it, but there's not much knowledge about how Paul looked or sounded. So he can speculate, no one can tell him that he's wrong. If you get something wrong on falconry, you'll have all these falconers on your back, right? Oh, that's right. And you know what? It has never happened. Um, I'm really careful with that. My One of my best friends growing up is a falconer, and um, that's who Nate Romanowski is actually based on, that character. And I, you know, I don't so much anymore, but I used to send him all the passages that had anything to do with Falcon. Say, so, you know, tell me where I'm wrong. Where did I screw up? And um, he would be happy to tell me that I screwed up. And falconers are very, very cranky in that regard. If you screw up, you'll hear from them. And I have never heard a legitimate falconer say, I got something wrong in regard to falconry. And now, Chuck, I want to talk to you about a couple of very specific things. Are prairie dog skins, rugs, as placemats <laughs> real? They are. No! They are. No! Uh, there's a local, there's a local <laughs> taxidermist where I live. A couple of years ago, I was in there buying bullets. And he said, are, are you shooting prairie dogs? And I, I said, yes, I've got a whole bunch out on our place. And he said, bring them in. And he showed me the prairie dog skin rugs that he'd been making and selling to every tourist who comes through. As a placemat. Oh, yes. golly, that's terrible. Number two, Aspen Grove, one organic system. Now, because I uh, remember from Cider House Rules, uh, are you a John Irving fan, by the way? I am. Not all, all right. of the books, but overall, yes. Okay, so John Irving uh, did a story about apple groves, and I knew that their root system was pretty in interconnected. But you make the assertion that an aspen grove is one organic system. I've never seen that anywhere before. It is considered one of the largest organic um, units uh, in the world. Is an aspen? Uh, yes, that all of their roots are intertwined. That is funny. And you know, uh, speaking of Irving. Homer Wells, who's the central character in Cider House Rules, one of his verbal tics is he says, right, after almost anything he doesn't want to contradict or, or confirm. <laughs> and Joe Pickett says, got it. That, you know, I don't know if that's one of his go-to phases or not, but it struck me as that. Also struck me, Nate Romanowski and the pitchfork. So I started thinking, this is not a giveaway, it's not a spoiler, you can't draw a conclusion. There's a list, the number of ways that Liam Neeson can kill people in the movies. Have you ever seen that website? I have not. I'll look that up. Yeah. How can Liam Neeson kill you in the movies? And I mean, it's got everything. Beer bottles, shards taped to his fingers and uh, trucks dropped on your head and stuff. Now we've got Nate in a pitchfork. That's new, isn't it? That is new. Yeah. He, that, that has not happened before. Yeah. All right. That he, doesn't mean he killed anybody with it. I'm just saying he has a pitchfork. 
Now, I want to observe on page 67, which is not unique to Dark Sky, but is unique perhaps to C.J. Box's politics. Quote, political entities always hire the exact opposite of what is being replaced. This is very similar to David Axelrod's view of how the American electorate votes for presidents when a two-term incumbent is leaving. They vote for the exact opposite. Where did you come up with your theory of political entities replacing vacancies? I actually think I heard that on the Hugh Hewitt show in the morning. Um, I mean, I listen every day, and and I think I, you had mentioned that before, and it struck me as absolutely true. Um, you always, even you know, organizations tend to always try to hire somebody who's you know to, to alleviate all the problems of the person who is leaving. Yep, and that's not that not always the best person, but that's it's just a natural human. I think it's just a human nature. In churches, in churches, whenever a pastor nominating committee happens, if the pastor is 60, they're going to go for 40. If the pastor is 40, they're going to go for 60. It's just like, uh, and they'll mix it up on ideology and preaching style, and it's true about everything else in organizational behavior. I just thought that was an interesting observation. Now, Elk, uh, all I know about Elk is what I learned up in Canada at the Banff Hotel. They're not exactly wily there, Chuck. Have you ever seen them uh, uh, come into Banff? I have not. I've never been there. I'm going to be there this summer, but I've never oh, they're they're ju- they just stroll through town. There's absolutely no uh, reticence about them. So when you write that elk are wily, is that a, a, a widely shared view of hunters? It is. In the wild, they are very wily. Um, elk in a domesticated situation where they know there is no threat. Like with tourists, Yellowstone Park, for example, they they just walk around. They're everywhere. Um, we had 250 elk come through our ranch last weekend, right by our house. Um, but in general, in while you're hunting, they're you know they're very very wily and they're very wild and um, you know they'll run away long before you can ever even get close. Um, and th- you know a lot of you know like we mentioned, take, a lot of elk hunters never get an elk because they never get a shot. Uh, are elk hunters limited to bow and arrow in Wyoming, or can they shoot with a rifle as well? They can shoot with a rifle as well. Uh, there's there's a hunt for archery hunting. It take, precedes rifle hunting every year, so there's you know there's both, but most people hunt with rifles. In Dark Sky, and I believe in previous novels, you've also asserted that animals know when the hunting season for them is. Is that oh, widely they- regarded as true? That is true. It's amazing. Um, I've been on our place long enough now. The opening day of deer season, we suddenly have big mule deer bucks all over our place. And um, I don't hunt them. They seem to know that. But other people are. And they just move in that day. They, are, they arrive. <laughs> Do you, is your land posted? They're not allowed to hunt open range in, in Wyoming? Correct. Yeah, it is posted. All right. Now, last question, and this is not about your place, but generally, there is no saddle string. So you can't do a Joe Pickett tour. Uh, But Wyoming might have a Joe Pickett tour. Do they yet? You know, they don't have an official one. Um, The little town I live in does because I base so many, you know, locations on, on local, you know, buildings and hotels and streets. But uh, I do know that an awful lot of tourists have come to Wyoming to kind of do their own unofficial Joe Pickett tour of all the touchstones, you know, from Yellowstone to the Red Desert to the Black Hills of Wyoming. Um, and uh, I know the State Tourism Department uh, brings that up. Now, I also believe that after you film it, because this became the case in the Game of Thrones, Wherever they've, and Harry Potter, wherever they filmed those movies, tours have sprung up in the location shots to show where the locations are. Uh, just something to consider in advance. How long will filming take for season one? And is season one one book or many books? Uh, they're going to do book one and book three in the first season. So open oh, that's like season. Master and Commander. That's what they yeah. did with Patrick O'Brien. They merged one and three. That's interesting. And I think it's wise, and their intention is to go through the series um, with two or three books per season um, and start from the beginning. So I couldn't be happier with that. Now, now how are you going to be involved as a writer, CJ? Because that has got to be of concern to you, right? Uh, you know what? I, I have um, I've come to realize, you know, watching other ones, the best thing to do, best part of it is to 
provide the source material and then step away. Um, you know, I, I've read the pilot episode and offered some notes on that just for authentic, you know, to keep it authentic. But beyond that, it's a totally different medium, you know, and I don't want to be in the middle of that. Um, it's just like with, with Big Sky, you know, every week I watch it on TV <laughs> like everybody else. <laughs> Big Sky. Okay, let's talk about Big Sky, my, my beef. Everybody says, oh, Chuck is on. I'm thinking Joe Pickett has made it to TV finally. So I turn on Big Sky, and it's the novel of my nightmares. It's The Highway, which I read. Yeah. I've read every one of your books. And The Highway is the novel of my night. I tell everyone, it's the scariest book I've ever read. And it's Ronald. And I say to myself, I've been duped. I, the Fetching Mrs. Hewitt lasted 10 minutes. I lasted 15 minutes. You should have put a warning on that thing. Well, I just didn't realize what a delicate flower that you were. You know? Oh, you're um, calling it Fletching Mrs. Hewitt is most. We do not like serial killers. We just don't. We're not. It's, is it doing well? Is is uh, Big yes. Scott? Okay, that's it's, it's, it, it's ABC's number one new show. Um, the the ratings on it are incredible. Um, they're taking a hiatus right now. They'll be back in April uh, with the bitter. They're going to do the Bitterroots book. Next. Oh gosh! So they're kind of not doing it out of order, but I actually you know, don't the, think I can bring myself to watch it. I'm sure that Americans love it. I'm sure it's got high. I don't know that I. Can, it is so scary. Now, did the success of Big Sky lead to the launch of the Joe Pickett, or is it uh, was it independent? Independent. Um, actually, the Joe Pickett uh, that was actually under development before Big Sky, but it's taken longer. Um, just to get it going. These things are crazy. Um, but so, yeah, uh, when David E. Kelly called me um, origi originally. Oh, it's David Kelly. Okay. Yeah. That's Big he, Sky. Uh, well, David Kelly is doing Big Sky. He called right. me. Well, I guess, you know, Joe Pickett is not available, so I'm interested in Cassie Duell. And ah. so that's how we started. Now tell me, have you watched Ted Lasso? I have, and I love it. I agree with everything you say, except when you say, tell people, don't watch Big Sky, um, <laughs> watch Ted Lasso. That part, I, I, I part company. Well, Kurt but Schlichter was never happier show. than when I said he was Roy Clark. I'm, I'm the Ted Lasso of talk radio, but he's the Roy Clark of talk radio. The question becomes, though, Jason Sudeikis, it wouldn't be a success without Jason Sudeikis. So right, everything right. depends on who Joe Pickett is. Uh, don't tell us anything. Are you happy? Yes. Yes, I am. I am thrilled, actually. Do you have another interview lined up? Is it is it time no. to go? Uh, oh, actually, yes. I do. All right. I, I will let you go. We got enough. We'll come back. But uh, CJ, congratulations. Dark Sky is terrific. But I want the audience to go and start with open season and read all 21. Do it the right way. Enjoy, Joe, and then you'll be ready for the TV show. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Hugh. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, talking to you about, you know, every book and following you every day. It's It's great. It's great. It's Mutual Admiration Society. See you in California when you are released from quarantine. I have gotten my first shot, so I will be released very soon. All right. Be well, friend. Thank you.